Judge Jackson, I am so glad that you take some pride in sharing your family's story, as you should. I know I take pride in sharing mine. My colleagues have heard it, but I never get tired of uh, reminding folks that I am the proud son of immigrants. My parents came to the United States from Mexico decades ago, and through their hard work and determination, they uh, raised three of us. My sister, my brother, and I, we all attended and graduated from college, and we've all found successful careers in public service. Now, it's a story that is shared by hardworking immigrant families across the country and over the course of generations, families who work diligently each day to create a better life and to contribute to the country. Whether it's as farm workers, short order cooks, celebrity chefs, software engineers, or tech CEOs, as school custodians, teachers, principals, whether they're documented or undocumented, people who migrate to this country seeking asylum, seeking refuge, or a shot at the American dream all deserve to be treated with dignity and humanity. Now, unfortunately, our laws and our courts don't always do that. Beyond our often cruel and counterproductive choices that we've made over the years when it comes to immigration policy, the language that we use to speak about immigrants can often have dehumanizing effects. For example, in the Immigration and Nationality Act, it's replete with references to quote-unquote aliens. And court opinions written by federal judges across the country can be found referring to undocumented persons as, quote, illegal aliens. Now, I know NASA has put a man on the moon, and there are billionaires increasingly exploring space. But let's be clear. No person is an alien, and no human being can be illegal. So with that context, I read your immigration-related decisions on the district court with great interest. Now, beyond the substance of your opinions, which, what stood out to me is that you seem to have tried to avoid making the same choice as many of your predecessors and many of your colleagues when not quoting statutes or precedent. Your, appear, your opinions appear not to refer to immigrants as alien or illegal, Instead, use terms such as undocumented and non-citizen. I imagine. I hope that was a conscious choice. The language we use and the language our courts use to describe people, whether immigrants, the formerly incarcerated, individuals who identify as LGBTQ, or other historically marginalized people, really matters a great deal. Our language matters. It's exactly for that reason that six years ago, Congress passed a bill to remove derogatory and offensive references to Black Americans, Asian Americans, and Native Americans from the U.S. Code. And it's why last year, President Biden ordered the Customs and Border Protection Agency and ICE to stop referring to migrants as illegal immigrants. With all that said, Judge Jackson, do you agree that the language we use to describe one another and the language used by the bench matters? Thank you, Senator. Um, as I mentioned uh, earlier in this hearing, judges um, are the only branch of government who are required to write our opinions, to explain uh, our decisions, and um, I have long believed in that capacity that our um, clarity and language matters. We're explaining the law to people, and um, people read and understand what the law is, what the rule of law is in this country through the opinions of judges. 
So they do matter, language. Thank you. Now I want to discuss with you an issue of uh, law and technology, an issue previously raised by Senator Ossoff earlier today, and uh, I'm excited to talk to you um, about this topic. Just as an aside, um, any day that an MIT engineer gets to question a Harvard lawyer, it's a good day. <laughs> so thank you for indulging. Um, but as you know, the Supreme Court only hears a tiny fraction of all federal appeals. That means that the cases that get to the Supreme Court are typically either new questions of law or very difficult questions of law. And I think the intersection of law and technology is one where many cases are both new and difficult. Over the, over the course of human history, innovation has constantly disrupted our culture and our norms. And for the most part with good intentions, but societal benefits have not always been the result of innovation. Innovations have challenged us to respond with new means of safeguarding basic rights, whether in the context of privacy, security, competition, employment, just to name a few. And I appreciate that the speed of innovation will always challenge our ability to keep the law up to date with new technologies and their impact. I've grappled with this question as a city council member, as a state senator, as a secretary of state, and now as United States Senator. But clearly, it's also a challenge for the courts, which often have to decide cases during that period between technological progress and the enactment of new laws that seek to account for that progress. Now, new technology uh, alone has given rise to a number of fundamental questions of law, as you mentioned yesterday and earlier, including how the Fourth Amendment applies to new contexts that no founder could have ever contemplated. And likewise, the court has to grapple with questions like how copyright law applies to computer code, and in the coming years, new technologies will present new questions, not just in the context of the Fourth Amendment, but in areas of communications, energy, transportation, healthcare, and many others. So if you can take just a minute, Judge, to uh, discuss the challenges that courts at every level face in addressing cases involving new and emerging technologies and how you as a Supreme Court justice would begin to prepare for these types of cases. Thank you, Senator. Um, the court does get cases that involve disputes uh, that touch on technological innovation, um, whether it is something like a copyright uh, kind of case or a patent kind of case or um, the Fourth Amendment search and seizure, um, new technologies do intersect with what, um, what the law says in the Constitution and in statutes. And at least as far as statutes are concerned, um, it's certainly much easier for judges who are doing their duty to interpret the law if Congress makes changes that update the statutes to track um, the modern innovations. What happens with uh, constitutional interpretation is similar to what um, I described earlier about cases in which the court uh, analogizes back to the time of the founding concerning the principles in something like search and seizure, what qualified as a search uh, that violated the Constitution when those words were written, and then uh, determines whether that same kind of violation is at issue with respect to the to technology today. And the court has done that um, with respect to searches regarding cell phones, um, police access to GPS data, um, tracking technology that is put on um, uh, vehicles, because these disputes do come up. And so, um, so I'll take this opportunity to encourage Congress to help us um, by um, 
ensuring that new technologies are addressed in statutes uh, that we interpret. You're absolutely right. Both judges and uh, members of Congress are never done doing more homework <laughs> and, and learning, hopefully. Uh, judge, on, on Monday, which at this point feels like so long ago, <laughs> uh, I suggested in my opening statement that uh, by the end of these hearings, America would know just how qualified you are to serve on the Supreme Court. And over the course of this hearing, I think the American people have seen that and have gotten to know you as a person. They have heard your family's journey and uh, everything that your nomination represents. Now, I also said on Monday that your qualifications bear repeating over and over again. And so, Judge, with your help, I'd like to remind the committee and the American people once again just some of your incredible credentials. Yes or no, after law school, did you serve as a law clerk for a district court judge, a court of appeals judge, and a Supreme Court justice? I did, Senator. Yes or no, did you practice law for more than 10 years before becoming a judge? Yes, Senator. And did that include time in private practice and time as a federal public defender? It did. How many years have you served as a federal district court judge? Uh, I served as a federal district court judge for, I believe, eight and a half years. And circuit since then? Circuit since last June. And as a district court judge, approximately how many opinions did you write? I think we've covered this before. As a district court judge, I believe I wrote somewhere in the neighborhood of 560. With a very low rate of uh, having been reversed, uh, if I've done my homework correctly. Look, I can go on and on, and don't worry, Mr. Chairman, I won't. <laughs> but Judge Jackson, for two days, Here's what I've seen. I've seen a number of my colleagues trying to engage with you in good faith on questions about the law, and you've answered them fully, fairly, and thoughtfully in every instance. You've shown yourself to have the keen intellect and legal acumen to serve on the Supreme Court. Now, you've also sat here and politely listened as some of my colleagues have attempted to disparage your judgment and character based on allegations that even, as uh, Senator Booker pointed out, conservative commentators have called meritless to the point of demagoguery. And through that, you've shown clearly that you have the temperament to serve on the Supreme Court. Now, this confirmation hearing has been a reminder and, in some ways, a new Exhibit A that for people of color, particularly those who have the audacity to try to be the first, often have to work twice as hard to get half the respect. Judge Jackson, I offer that with your talent and exemplary qualifications on full display, if my colleagues truly believe in maintaining the legitimacy of the Supreme Court if they really care about Americans' faith in the judicial system, they will see that even if they may disagree with you on a particular area of the law, that you're exactly the type of judge that should serve on the Supreme Court. You're exactly the type of judge that should receive bipartisan support, not just from this committee, but from the full Senate. And if any senator doesn't, then I hope they'll think long and hard about what it says to the country about the politicization of the Supreme Court, that if someone as eminently qualified as Judge Jackson, in all the ways that we've been discussing, cannot receive bipartisan support. Judge, I know there's just a couple minutes left, and I'd like to ask you just one last question. Last Friday, in my preparation for these hearings, I took the opportunity to spend some time with 
a group of students at South San Francisco High School. I went there to speak with them about this historic Supreme Court nomination and to speak with them about you. We had a great conversation about how the court's decisions affect the everyday lives of Americans and about the past and the future of the Supreme Court. But as I was speaking with the students, I couldn't help but be reminded <clears throat> of my own high school experience. When one of my teachers discouraged me from applying to MIT because they didn't want me to be disappointed, I turned that discouragement into motivation. Judge Jackson, I know that you too have been doubted on your way to the seat that you find yourself in today. Even over the last three days of this hearing, your experience and qualifications have been called into question by some, despite your clear, lengthy record of talent, achievement, and accomplishment. So I want to end my time today by asking you this question. On behalf of the young people I visited with last Friday in South San Francisco and for the many others across the country who are watching this confirmation hearing today, what would you say, Judge Jackson, to all those young Americans, the most diverse generation in our nation's history, what do you say to some of them who may doubt that they can one day achieve the same great heights that you have. Thank you, Senator. Um, that was very moving. And I appreciate the opportunity to uh, speak to young people. I appreciate it very much. I do it a lot for the reasons that you have articulated. I. Um, I hope to inspire people to try to follow um, this path because I love this country, because I love the law, because I think it is important that we all invest in our future. And the young people are the future. And so I want them to know that they can do and be anything. And I'll just say that um, I will tell them what uh, an anonymous person said to me once. I was walking through Harvard Yard my freshman year. As I mentioned, I went to uh, public school and I didn't know anything about Harvard until um, my debate coach took me there to enter a speech competition. And I thought, this is a great university. It was basically one of the only ones I'd seen. And I said, maybe I'll apply when I'm a senior. But I get there, and whoa, <laughs> so different. I'm from Miami, Florida. Boston is very cold. Um, it was. Um, it was rough. It was different from anything I'd known. There were lots of students there who were um, prep school kids like my husband, <laughs> um, who knew all about <laughs> <laughs> knew all about Harvard, and, and that was not not me. And I think the first semester I was really homesick. I was really questioning. Um, do I belong here? Can I, can I make it in this environment? And I was walking through the yard in the evening, and a black woman I did not know was passing me on the sidewalk. And she looked at me, and I guess she knew how I was feeling. And she leaned over as we crossed and said, 
persevere. I would tell them to persevere. Thank you, Judge Jackson. You don't have to hope. I'll tell you right now, you do inspire. You are an inspiration. Thank and you. I will associate myself with the uh, closing words of my colleague and my brother, Senator Booker, that I too refuse to let anyone steal my joy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <laughs>